everyone. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Tonight, I am going to be talking about, my gosh, I think tonight's the fourth in our series. I'm not even sure. I've lost track. But um, we're, I'm doing a series of Facebook Lives um, all about the topic of guided reading. The reason I am doing this is to celebrate the launch of my brand new series, which is called Mastering guided reading, and it is a program I've written to help teachers with um, teaching guided reading, especially in second grade. And tonight, I'm going to be talking about all about that special teacher tap-in time and how to get the most bang for your buck during that time. Now, a couple things before we get started. Uh, if this is a video that you think some of your teaching friends would enjoy, if you would make sure to please share the video, all you have to do is hit the share button down below and let your friends know um, um, that this is something may, they may enjoy. I also have a bunch of really good, I hope you think good, freebies. Those are located up above, and I think it says like click here or grab your freebies here, something like that. And it has a link to a Google Doc. And in there, there's a couple of freebies I think you'll enjoy, and I will be referring to them tonight, so you might want to look at those. Also, I would love to know what grade you teach and where you're located, so then I can tailor any of my questions or any of those things down below in the conversation. I'm sorry, I can tailor all my, my comments and some of my content, hopefully, to your grade level and what you're working on, if you'll just comment down below with that. And um, let's see, if you have any questions, um, I have no idea um, what questions you guys might have, so I tried to do my best to write um, the the presentation for this live um, based on what I thought people might want to know, but I'm sure I did not cover all the bases. So if you have any questions about teacher tap and time, go ahead and type them in below. I may not answer them right away, but I hope to answer them throughout the live, and I will definitely have a question and answer session at the end of this live that I will get to them. So I will check them then also, and I'll make sure to see that in the um, comments down below. So make sure if you have a question, put it below. It doesn't have to be necessarily about tap and time. It could be about anything that has to do with guided reading, because if I don't answer it tonight, I might answer it in one of my future, fa future Facebook Lives. I've been keeping a running list of questions that I've been asked that I will be addressing in future Facebook Lives. So for all you know, your question may be added to the list, so it gets covered later. So what I want to talk about today is that teacher tap and time, and what exactly is this tap in time? Well, let me show you, I wrote kind of my own definition of what tap in time is. So in my book, tap in time is you've got your kids, you're sitting at guided reading, you've went ahead and introduced the text, you have um, gone over um, the tricky words, you have given them a question, you've set the purpose for what they're reading for, and you've given them a question to answer, and then you've set the kids off to read independently on their own. Now this is when tap in time happens. All the kids are reading by themselves, they're reading to themselves. You're going to select a handful of kids each guided reading time to listen to them read. Um, now I, it depends on how long you have for guided reading. In, in my experience, I usually got two kids done, sometimes three, usually it was two. Um, but I would do this with about two kids each session. My groups had between two to five, I'm sorry, two to six kids in them. So that gives you an idea of how big my groups were. Um, what, what I would do is I would literally, when I say tap in, they would be reading their little books and holding it. For example, they'd be holding their little book and I would reach over and I tap their hands and I'd say, go ahead and, um, read to me from where you are. And I'd make the kid put the book down because I was at a kidney table and I could read, you, you know, how you're experienced. And I could read the text upside down because I've done it um, forever. But I would look over them reading as they read. And I'm going to go over the exact steps that I used in um, my tap in time. And I'm sorry if I'm, I'm multitasking right now, so I apologize if it seems that I'm missing this not looking at the camera directly, so I apologize. So when I did teacher tap and time, the first thing you're going to do is you can find your student, you're going to ask them, say, hey, can you go ahead and read to me from where you are? Then while they read their whatever bit of reading to me orally, I would take a short running record of that reading. And I had a special form, and I'm going to show you guys and share that form with you free tonight that I use personally for my running record and my tap in time. That's going to be in a couple more slides, so you'll get to see it in a minute. I do a short running record. I didn't spend very long. It was maybe a hundred words, if that. And um, I, I've been doing running records for a long time, so it was something that was 
pretty natural for me, so it wasn't very hard. I was very lucky. Um, then this is where tap and time can be hard because you really are teaching on the fly. You're using what you know about reading instruction and that student particularly in order to tailor your comments questions and instruction to push that reader even further. So after they read to you, you're going to stop, you're going to ask them a comprehension question to make sure that they understood the chunk they just read to you. So you're not going to be able to prepare that question just in advance. That's something you're going to have to do on the fly. And sometimes you could ask simply, especially in the beginning of the year, it can, if you're still not confident or comfortable or used to doing that, just asking questions. Who's the main character? Where does the story take place? How do you know that? What do you think the problem is? What do you think the problem will be? How could this character resolve the problem? You could, any of those story elements are easy questions for you to just pull out on the fly when you're doing the reading time. So the kid would read to me. I'd ask them a comprehension question to make sure that they understood the text. And then I do something called a grow and a glow. And I actually wrote it backwards on the slide. I always start with the glow and then do the grow. I just did it out of habit. Um, but I like to do the glow first because I like to compliment them. So if I was reading with a kid and they finished reading, I would be like, okay, well, who do you think the main character in the story is? And they would tell me, because this is um, one of the books from my Mastering Guided Reading Pack. This is a freebie that is available to you in the comment or the description box above. If you click on something about a preview and you can get your free copy of um, one book of the text, it's gonna take you to all the Red Bird books and lesson plans and materials for it free. So that's why I'm using it as a model. But I would say, you know, who is the main character in this story? And they could hopefully tell me that the main character is Red Bird because the topic of this reading is story elements. So hopefully kids have had some exposure to story elements. Then I would give them a glow. I really like, and in this text, and I'm going to have to hold it right here and see if you can see it. In a text, it said he hid behind some leaves. For, for example, maybe the kid, kid said he hid behind some of the, he hid behind some of the leaves. So if the kid did that and they went back and self-corrected it, my glow could be, I really like how when you read that he hid behind some of the leaves that you knew that didn't sound right. And you went back and you tried to think about what made sense. And that's what good readers do when they're reading. If it doesn't sound right, they look at the word and think about what makes sense. And, um, that's exactly what you did. So I'm proud of you. Awesome job. Now, for example, maybe though, when the child was reading, one of the things that they may have done is in the first sentence, the wind blew softly, a flock of birds chirped in a tree. Maybe they said the wind blew softly, a flock of birds chirped in a tree. So they had a hard time with that word. So I would use that as I grow. I noticed when you were reading the sentence, a flock of birds chirped in the tree, that you really struggled with the word flock. Now let's look at that word. How could we chunk that word so we could read it later? And I would actually underline, because this is a consumable book, I'd underline the chunks in there as we talked about how they could chunk the word up so to help them um, to help them remember to chunk the words and say, next time you're reading and you come across your word you don't know, I don't want you to just go back and reread and think about my, what makes sense. I want you to also look at the chunks in the word. So by then you've done a comprehension question, you complimented them on something you like, and you gave them a strategy for them to grow with. So they're going to be working on chunking and that's their thing they're going to be working on. And you'll be able to check on it in later times that fast. And then you're going to move on to the next student. It should take honestly about two minutes per child. It is a fast process. It is not something where you um, are working slowly with it. Now, I mentioned in part of my um, steps in doing a tap in time, I mentioned that I did a, um, a running record and I hope everybody is familiar with running records. A running re record is just basically a written way to code the text to show what a student does orally when they read. So it shows what they call correctly, what they call incorrectly, and strategies that they use to figure out the word. Now, I know that the longer I've been doing running records, I have, I know, to some degree, developed my own system or key of how I code the text. However, 
keep in mind, there is an actual real system for coding the text. It isn't something that each person makes up. And it is important that you really try your best to stick to the standardized key, because if you have to refer back to it later, you need to know, A, what you were recording. B, if you give that information to another teacher, maybe they're pulled out for um, another reading group. Hopefully, if the child is struggling, maybe they'll get reading more than one time a day, and we call that being double dipped. Um, you want to be able to give that information to that other teacher so they can also get a feel of how the student reads. So you can't just like be like, ah, I'm going to do it this way. Um, my friend Christine, and I hope she's here tonight. Hi, Christine. She um, shared this scoring sheet, which is a great cheat, uh, cheat sheets by Heinemann. And I hadn't found it. I've been looking for a good cheat sheet and I've seen some and most of them are really good, but they just didn't include everything. This is an, a fantastic one. It's two pages. So you could do it front and back to print it off, keep it with you. So if you're, you can't remember some of the coding, you can keep it right there to look at. And I've included the bit.ly link to this. It is a freebie by Heinemann. And if you look in the description above, it is located up at the top. So you'll be able to get that scoring sheet up there for you. So like you might be saying, okay, so I get the fact that I read with a kid, I do a running record, I ask a comprehension question, I do a glow and then I do a grow and then I move on. So, but how do I come up with the grow? Like what, what, what could that be? So I wrote just off the top of my head, a couple of examples that are easy, easy, easy to pull out. If you notice that your child that you're reading with is using punctuation when they're reading, if they're attending to periods, if they're attending to commas, if they're reading like the character would talk, if they're putting emphasis on like the, like if it was bump was the word and it was bolded and it was all capitalized and if they read it with emphasis, those are easy things that you can say. I really like how when you were reading, you sounded just like the Susie character or the character Susie would sound. That was awesome. That's an easy thing to touch on to. Um, you can also go back and say um, if they find a tricky word and they went back and corrected themselves, you can complement the strategy that they used. You can say, I really like how you thought about what made sense. And this is that MSV, when you're coding running records, one of the things you're going to be looking for is how do kids decode tricky words? Do they use MS or V? And that's meaning structure or visual cues. And so if you notice that your kid is doing that, it's like, I really like how you looked at that word and said, hmm, what does this word look like? You know, what what makes sense? Does it sound right? Um, that kind of thing. So that's an easy thing to strategy. And if you're familiar with the Beanie Baby strategy, decoding strategies, those are really, really popular. Um, and I don't even know them all because I honestly, I did not use them. Um, but you could complement on those kind of decoding strategies. I actually stuck with like chunking the words, looking all the way through the words, taking your, um, getting your mouth ready, taking a running start, going back and rereading, you know, that kind of thing. I actually did not use the Beanie Babies because I can never remember them, just to be honest with you. It had nothing to do with the kids. It was, I couldn't remember it. So what are some things now, like if you notice like, wow, how do you, how do you pick a grow? And if a kid is struggling, hopefully a child is not making too many errors in the text because if the child is making that many errors, you may want to revisit and it may not be an instructional level text. You may need to bump the text down and do either a different group or a different book because the book is too hard. If you're having a hard time picking out a grow because there's so many errors, that's not good. Um, some easy things that you can look for is if you notice a child is having trouble like with a word in the text and one of the words in the text is stared in, in here and you wanted to figure out, you, you know, you could show them and see like, this is the word stared. You know, what do you think that word means in this sentence? And they can use different things like punctuation. Sometimes um, in nonfiction text, they'll use a comma. Like they'll say um, a rural community or one that has lots of farmland, comma, um, to explain perhaps what the um, tricky word could be. Sometimes you could ask them, in the, does it make sense? Do you, well, do, do you think that is a describing something? Do you think it's a person, place, or thing? Thinking about what part of speech. And also just simply going back and rereading around the word to be able to figure out an unknown word is an easy grow. To say, like, oh, you don't know what stared means? Let's go back and read this, the next two sentences and keep on reading a little bit and see if we can figure out what it means. And hopefully they'll realize it means that he looked. Now, one of the freebies that I made for you that is located in the handouts above, I went ahead and I combined a lot of what you might see in the, the sisters. If you do the daily five, the sisters wrote a book called The Cafe. I think it's a cafe menu. I don't remember the exact title. The cafe is in the title. And in it, what they did basically is they wrote down um, what students need to the acronym of cafe. It's C is 
comprehension, A is accuracy, F is fluency, and E is expanding vocabulary. And whenever they conferenced with kids, they would choose one of those areas as their grow, and they would make sure the kid realized this is what you're working on, and they would actually put the child's name up on a bulletin board where those strategies were marked, where it had comprehension, accuracy, fluency, and um, expanding vocabulary. And um, anytime they learn a new strategy, they would post like an I can card or explain how to use the strategy. And then kids that were working on comprehension would put their post-it note on comprehension. So, and I don't even know where, oh, that's where I got many. I was like, that was a tangent. Where did, I, where did I go with that? But that is where I got some of the ideas for this cheat sheet. If you're looking for some things to compliment and things to kids to work on, this is kind of your cheat sheet on how to do that. And I will say, personally, I did use the cafe menu to some degree in my classroom. I didn't do as much reading conferencing as I would have liked because I simply did not have time. Instead, when I was doing that tap in time and I said, you know, something to the effect of, you know, I noticed, um, that when you read the word flocky, you know, we need the strategy of chunking. So let's work at how, how can we chunk this word apart? So I would say to the kids, so you're going to be working on decoding and that's going to be figuring out tricky words. So I'm going to put your post it under, um, the accuracy part of it, um, of the caffeine menu. So I actually did my reading conferences within that tap in time. So whenever we talked about that grow and what kids are working on and where they would be within the cafe menu, if you're familiar with that, that is when, um, I marked the menu when we talked about different strategies, I actually had my cafe board and I have a picture of it somewhere. If you want me guys, if you want me to, um, leave it in the comment section. It's kind of a dark picture, but I do have a picture of it. But I had my cafe board literally right behind me in guided reading so that as we did, um, like talked about one of the strategies or I found that a child needed to practice one of the strategies, I could literally turn and point to it. And often whenever I did the teaching point within guided reading, um, if it was a teaching point I'd done across all the groups, that is another time when I would add it to the board, not just my mini lesson um, with my whole group time. So if you would like a cheat sheet of some possible glows and grows, it is right there for you. Now, so what do you do with this information? So how do I organize all this? So this right here was my, I called it my assessment binder or my guided reading binder. This was one I had several years ago. This is one I've had that is more recent. You'll notice one is white and one is black. Um, so this is my more recent one. Inside of it, I had all my guided reading forms. For example, these are like blank forms that I used. I have a um, RTI kit, which is Dutch sight words. So it had all my sight words. I had um, my checklist. I had uh, my whole group plans of where everybody would be. Um, I had a graph to show progress in students. So these are all like my blank pages. And then within the blank after the blank pages i have tab dividers and if you could see it right there the tab dividers are numbered and each number represented a student you can label them if you want to with names but i just reuse the tabs from year to year and that is why i chose not to um put names on them. So I just put their class number. And whenever I was conferencing with the kids, I'd say, what's your number? And they'd say seven, because I could never remember. So I turned to the seven tab and I would have all my information of anecdotal records that I had been keeping on that student right there. So let me show you how I kept up with that form. So this is an example of a past student that I had several years ago. Um, and this is a form that I used whenever I was doing tap and time. This is where I recorded that information. The far left comment column is the date. The second column is what did I notice about this child? What did I notice they were doing? Did I notice they did a great job of um, fluency? Did they monitor that punctuation? Did they really struggle with thinking about what made sense when they were reading and tricking? figuring out those tricky words. Um, that's where I just jotted notes. It was nothing so, like, obviously it wasn't even like that great. It was literally bulletined, just write there, jot their notes. The next column you'll see is the series of checks because that is my running record. I told you it was super simple, super easy, um, easy to go. And I actually had a teacher one time that was like, how do you know that your running record is accurate? Because I was doing it on, on a blank paper and with not with the text written. And I told her, I said, well, I don't know a hundred percent. And the idea is not for it to be 
completely accurate is to get me a big picture of that child's reading. So it's possible I made a mistake in it, but I know overall where that child is reading by looking at it in the big picture. If I see lots of underlines, I know they're doing a lot of repeating. If I see lots of checks, they're doing a lot of correct calls. If they are, if I'm writing a word and writing SC over it, I know that they're self-correcting that word once they're, um, once they get further in the text and they're um, self-correcting their errors. So it may not be perfect. And I was okay with that. It was fine with me because I wanted a big picture. If you are a person who needs, like you're like, oh, I can't, I can't do that. You're like, oh, no, 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 no. For every um, level of text in the guided reading program, mastering guided reading program I write, um, there is a running record. So if you were reading Redbird on the mid-level, mid-second grade level with this group, you can print out the running record for the tap and time with kids if you want to. It is available. I just didn't do it because I didn't feel like I needed it. And that last column was sometimes blank. And, but I tried to mark in that column because that was, what do I need to do next for this child? And that may be double check, are they able to chunk words? Check for chunking, you know, next time that you have, have them read. Um, introduce the chunky monkey strategy, if, I, if you use the Beanie Babies strategies, that kind of thing. So it's, what am I going to do next? And it wasn't something that I spent a lot of time on. It was more just a note instead of keeping a gazillion post-it notes or trying to keep it all in my head, that is where I wrote it. So next time when I read with that kid and next time I had to happen time with that kid, I could glance down and say, Oh, they had trouble with chunking. Now I need to double check to make sure that they're doing it this go around. Are they doing better or not? And I could say, you know, last time we read together, I noticed you had a really hard time chunking words, but you did fantastic this time. So it's a great way to just keep up with what you're working on. Now, this is an older version of that form. Here is the updated version. Um, and it is based off one of the sisters' forms from several years ago. And I, I've tweaked it a little bit over time, but I'm sure that's probably where I got the original idea. Um, and this is included as a freebie up above in the um, handout link. But if you look at the very top, you put the student's name. On the left side, after you've done that initial running record and you've read with that child in the beginning of the school year, think about what did that child do well in that reading. And I want you to think about that as their strength. That's something that they're good at. And you can use a highlighter and just highlight their strength. Now on the right side, after you've read with them, I want you to think about what can I do with this child to make them a better reader. And I went ahead and listed things for you. For example, decoding skills, retelling, fluency, vocabulary, using the text to support their answers, using context clues, comprehension, monitoring, and then other. So if you wanted to hand write in a specific skill that the child is working on or strategy the child is working on, you can write that in there. So you have already given yourself a place to start. If you do that at the beginning of the year, then you already have kind of a bank to pull from for your glows and grows um, if you are stuck. Okay. Then, it, then the bottom of the form, I kept all that information I showed you above. It's still the same format. It's the date. And it says teaching point of the tap in. So what did I notice the child was um, needed some help with? And I put lines now for the uh, running record because I wished I had done that with mine earlier because sometimes they went on a slope and it bothered me just because I'm weird. And then the last one is, again, what am I going to do next with that kid? So that is available for you free. I had one of those on every child in the class. There are about, give or take, four blocks on that front page. So you could do four tap-in times. So that's probably like, what, a month of guided reading um, anecdotal records right there on one page, right there at your fingertips. Now, so let's just say, oops, I'm missing a slide. Oh, man, is it missing? Let me see. Yeah, it is missing. Man, that's okay. Also included in your freebie is if you are worried about um, how do I keep track of who I have read with and who I have not? In the freebie, what I have for you guys is one page, and on that one page is four little boxes that are charts, and it's basically a checklist. Assuming that you have four reading groups, you can write in each little checklist your student's name and date when you've done a tap-in with them. And it's that simple. So you can look at your sheet to figure out who you want to read with. Another trick that I did, to be honest with you, is that whenever I did guided reading groups on Monday, I read with this child. Whenever I did guided reading on Tuesday, I read that child. And so kids literally had assigned seats for guided reading just because I had some behavior problems that last year anyway, and it made it easier and faster and the kids liked routine. So it actually worked very well for them, but it also gave me assigned seating. So I knew who to tap in with because that chair was um, assigned to a certain day. So that's probably not like the best, most effective way, but it worked for me. 
task. So that is some of my ideas and tips to make the most of your teacher tap in time. I hope it helped. I would love to know if you have any questions or comments or anything else you want to know about guided reading. Please make sure you comment above. I'm going to take the moment right now to go ahead and hop on over to my Facebook and see if I can answer some of those questions. I will say I have noticed that um, there is a time delay in um, when you write comments and when I see them necessarily in my um, Facebook live feed. So if I don't see it before I've ended my live stream, I will make sure to comment and I will comment below yours. So let's see. Right now I'm loading my page. Uh, Christina said, love the recording sheet. Thank you. I am Bursa. So thank you for the information. Im information. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Rachel said, great info. This is great. Um, this list of strengths and weaknesses would be great info for parents during conferences. That is a great idea, actually. You could literally highlight it for the parents of what they need to work on at home, and then you can give them strategies on how to improve it. That is a really good idea. Um, I like that a lot. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. I just refreshed it because sometimes it takes a while. And make sure while I am looking at this, I think that's everything right now, but it's hard to tell. If you like this video, make sure that you hit the share button so that your other teacher friends can enjoy it um, and let them know about it. If you are interested in purchasing my um, Mastering Guided Reading program, it is available in my store. If you look at the link above, it has two different versions. One has um, word study centers to match it, and the other does not. All of them have word study as part of the guided reading block. The word study centers are things that the kids can do independently um, while you're teaching guided reading. Um, so that is an extra, just a few, few extra dollars if you're looking at that. Um, I have also started a Facebook group all about um, literacy, and it's all about second grade literacy. So if you are interested in joining that, you have the link above and you can hop on in and join our community that is growing very nicely and we also I think I also have every I think this is the fourth um, Facebook live that I've done so I have the links to all the other ones in the series if you would like to watch all the other lives about guided reading and here is my schedule of what we will be doing next so today is the 19th and we're working on tap in time and next time we talk it will be on Monday which will be about developing comprehension and your readers and I would love any questions that you have all about comprehension because I haven't written it yet and I'm not sure where I'm gonna go with it I've got a, I wrote down a couple ideas but I would love um, like if like I would love to know what you want to know if you have a specific issue with the child or a certain concern in the past and you want to know an idea of how to um, help the child with that issue, please just leave it in the comments and I will definitely help me use that to help me write the next one. And I noticed that Stephanie just asked, um, she just said, are you doing a webinar on word work? And I honestly, I was not going to do one on word work, but I shall do one now and it will have to take place in the beginning of August because we're running out of July days, but I would be more than happy to do that. Um, um, Stephanie and I will show you that probably, I don't know, what is that? Probably August 1st or 3rd or something. I have to get a schedule out. School is starting for my own children and I won't do any Facebook lives the first week of their school because they'll need some time to get used to, um, the routine itself, but I will definitely do one on word work if you're interested. Um, and I saw somebody also had the question about where do I get the, handouts that you're looking for. If you go to the description about this video, it is going to give you a quick blurb and at the very end it says see more. That's because I'm wordy and I wrote too much basically. <laughs> Click on see more and that's going to show you everything that I wrote about this video and I wrote about uh, a, a, just a synopsis of the video. I wrote about how to get the free version of your preview of the Mastering Guided Reading and there's the two links below so you can see that. Um, the freebie is in the preview on TPT and it says next grab the handouts from this live and it is a bit.ly link and that bit.ly link will take you to the handout um, which describes what tap in time is, um, the steps that I do for tap in time, it has the anecdotal record sheet, the checklist of how to keep uh, up with who you have met with and it also has the suggested list of grows and grows which someone suggested for um, conferences 
So I hope you guys can join me here again on the 24th. I'll be here again at 8 p.m. I hope to see you then, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you so much.